There is a lot of astronomy misinformation online today. It's impossible to avoid, whether it be uninformed articles saying blatantly false information, or the godforsaken AI-generated space channels that are popping up everywhere today. There are entire planets people think exist that don't, like J1407b, which isn't even a real planet and was refuted years ago, which I have a full video about. One of the main reasons I made this channel was to help stop misinformation any way I can. I've made a whole video about J1407b and how it doesn't exist, so I might as well do more videos like that. And this one is about habitable exoplanets. Everywhere you look, there's someone claiming that NASA found Earth 2.0, or this planet is better for life than Earth, and similar things. Most of these focus on specific planets, most notably Kepler-22b, Kepler-186f, Proxima Centauri b, the entire TRAPPIST-1 system, and dozens more. But most people don't realize that every single one of these planets are terrible candidates for being habitable. They are some of the best candidates we have, but that only means that the other planets are worse, not that they're any good. So, I'll be going planet by planet, explaining why every potentially habitable exoplanet probably isn't habitable. And, after that, I'll go over some planet candidates that actually have a good chance of being habitable. First, let's start with the notorious Kepler-22b. Kepler-22b is in the habitable zone of its star, where temperatures are right for liquid water to exist. Other than that, it shares absolutely no similarities with Earth, and should have been removed from the list of potentially habitable exoplanets a long time ago. For one thing, we don't even accurately know its mass. We know that's less than 9 times the mass of Earth, but that's it. We do, however, know its radius, and it's 2.3 times wider than Earth. Rocky planets usually don't get that wide, and with Kepler-22b's likely mass, that really only leaves one possibility. Kepler-22b isn't a rocky planet. This means that it probably doesn't even have a solid surface, and resembles Neptune more than Earth. It is possible that Kepler-22b could be a planet entirely covered in hundreds of miles of water, which would account for its low density, but just because water could exist there doesn't make it habitable. Ultra-deep oceans like this probably aren't good places for life, because, from what we can tell, life requires some sort of volcanic activity to start up, or that being hydrothermal vents in the deep oceans or hot springs on the surface. It's kind of hard to get these places when all your volcanoes are in underwater ocean with pressure so high the bottom layers become solid. So, whatever Kepler-22b is, it's probably a smaller version of Neptune or an ocean planet with water too deep for its own good. It's safe to say that Kepler-22b, despite having the right temperatures for life, probably, most likely doesn't have anything else going for it, making it almost certainly uninhabitable. This is extremely important for the rest of this video. Just because an exoplanet is in the habitable zone of its star, that does not mean it's habitable. The habitable zone just means that any planet within it should have temperatures right for liquid water to exist on its surface. It says nothing about the amount of water an exoplanet has, or its atmosphere, or if it has enough atmospheric pressure to support liquid water, or its size, or every other factor that makes a planet habitable. From what we can tell so far, habitable planets are rare. Extremely rare. Anyways, the next exoplanet on this list is Kepler-186f. Kepler-186f, at face value, is a lot better than Kepler-22b. It actually has a mass comparable to Earth, for example, at about 1.5 times the mass of Earth. So, unlike Kepler-22b, it's probably a planet that has solid ground. Out of all the planets I'm going to cover today, I think Kepler-186f has one of the highest chances of actually being habitable. But, of course, it has a major problem. It has an equilibrium temperature of negative 120 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 85 Celsius. That's colder than the average day temperature of Mars. In fact, it's about halfway between the temperatures of Mars and Jupiter. To be fair, we don't know Kepler-186f's actual temperature. That number comes from an estimate if it doesn't have an atmosphere. If it does, a greenhouse effect could warm it up. However, it still doesn't change the fact that this planet would be extremely cold, even with an Earth-like atmosphere. If you manage to get an atmosphere thick enough to make temperatures habitable, it would be pretty easy to tip right over the edge and get stuck with a Venus-like atmosphere. So, Kepler-186f is probably either too cold to sustain life, in an extremely delicate and unlikely balance, or a hellish Venus-like world. It's caught between two awful extremes, and we don't know which one it is. There is still a slim chance that Kepler-186f could be habitable, but I wouldn't keep my hopes up. You may have heard that Kepler-186f could have red planets if it was habitable, and that would probably be true. But this planet highlights another problem in exoplanet science. People only really talk about the potentially habitable ones. Whenever people talk about Kepler-186f, nobody talks about Kepler-186b, c, d, and e, the other four planets in the system, all between 1 to 2.5 Earth masses that orbit closer to the star than F. There are four other worlds in this system, four other planets that can be just as interesting as Mars or Venus or Titan or Mercury, yet nobody talks about them. 
Planets don't need to be habitable to be interesting, and by only focusing on worlds like Kepler-186f, we ignore the thousands of other extremely interesting worlds in the universe. But it only gets worse from here. In contrast to Kepler-186f, Proxima b is, in my opinion, the least likely to be habitable of any planet on this list. In fact, it's probably not just uninhabitable, but uninhabitable to such an extreme that Mars and Venus look like paradises by comparison, and that's not an exaggeration. The fact that we even consider Proxima b to be potentially habitable is insane to me, because it has so much going wrong that it makes it look like habitability is impossible. Of course, until we figure out its environment, we won't actually know for sure, but with all we know so far, you can make a pretty good case that Proxima b is dead. From what we know so far, everything that could possibly go wrong for Proxima b probably has. From the star orbits to its distance from said star to the existence of Proxima c, a second planet in the system, absolutely everything has it out for Proxima b. I've already made a full video going more in depth about the habitability of Proxima b, which is linked in the top corner of this video. To avoid repeating myself, here's everything that probably makes Proxima b an irradiated wasteland that would make Mercury jealous in a quick list. 1. It orbits a red dwarf that flares a lot. 2. Those flares probably strip its atmosphere and oceans away, if it even had any. 3. When red dwarfs are young, they like to fling volatiles like water away, making it unlikely that Proxima b even formed with water in the first place. 4. Proxima b is probably tidally locked to its star. 5. Proxima c exists, and there's some evidence for an asteroid belt between the two planets. If this belt does exist, Proxima c is in a perfect location to fling asteroids toward Proxima b, which, in the time it's been around for, have probably been enough to sterilize the planet. And 6. Temperatures on Proxima b can suddenly drastically spike thanks to Proxima Centauri's flares. It's really bad. With all this going against it, I can't imagine a universe where Proxima b is habitable. Of course, we don't actually know what the environment of this planet is like. Because it doesn't transit star from our perspective, atmospheric characterization is extremely difficult, but it's unlikely to have an atmosphere at all. These problems are common for most red dwarfs, including the next stop. TRAPPIST-1 is one of the most interesting systems we've come across, with seven Earth-sized planets orbiting the star, three of which are in the habitable zone. For more in-depth exploration of the system, check out my grand tour of TRAPPIST-1 video. But, like Proxima b, these planets are subject to the flares of a red dwarf. TRAPPIST-1 is actually really calm as far as red dwarfs go, but that's likely because of its age, which is around 8 billion years. It was likely much more active when it was young and the planets were forming, like Proxima Centauri. Over the 8 billion year history of the system, TRAPPIST-1 has had more than enough time to blow away the oceans and skies of any planet that had them. And we actually have evidence for this. TRAPPIST-1b, the first planet of the system, is very likely airless according to data from the James Webb Space Telescope, making it like a supermercury of sorts. This isn't too surprising, but so far, TRAPPIST-1c, d, and g all show signs of being airless too, and there's not enough data for e, f, and h yet. This is bad news for the rest of the system, as if all four of those planets are airless, then it becomes incredibly likely that the remaining three are as well. TRAPPIST-1c actually has a decent chance of holding on to a thin atmosphere, as I explained my grand tour of TRAPPIST-1 video, but that doesn't change anything. So far, it seems likely that most of the TRAPPIST-1 planets have no atmosphere, including the ones in the habitable zone. But, they probably do have volcanic activity, B specifically, so just because they probably aren't habitable doesn't mean the system is uninteresting. Just TRAPPIST-1 is, yet again, not a good place to look for life. K218b is our next stop, and it's over 8 times the mass of Earth. This mass alone means it isn't Earth-like no matter what. For comparison, that's half the mass of Neptune. That already makes its chances for habitability slim, since it's probably either an ice giant or an ocean world like Kepler-22b. However, K218b is different because the James Webb Space Telescope potentially discovered dimethyl sulfide, a sign of life on the planet. However, this discovery has been massively clickbaited, so I'll clear it up right now. James Webb did not detect dimethyl sulfide, it detected evidence for it, and the dimethyl sulfide is not actually confirmed to be there. The scientists who made the discovery didn't even claim to have found dimethyl sulfide, just tentative hints of it. No scientist actually claimed a definitive detection of a sign of life, that's just clickbait. James Webb also observed signs of a water ocean on K218b, but just like the dimethyl sulfide, not definitively. But this idea of a water ocean on K218b is now considered unlikely because, as it turns out, oceans made of lava, not water, fit the data better. I've already talked about this more in my Ocean Planets video, but essentially, K218b is most likely an uninhabitable super Venus with never-ending oceans of lava on its surface. Definitely not habitable, but like all the other planets so far, 
a super Venus with lava oceans is still an incredibly interesting world to study. Gliese 667 CC, like Kepler 186F, actually does have a chance of being habitable. It has an estimated temperature of about 39 degrees Fahrenheit, assuming it has no atmosphere, so it's already better than Kepler 186F in that regard. However, the planet has an uncomfortably high mass of over 3.5 times heavier than Earth at minimum. It also orbits yet another red dwarf. Because of its high mass, it's much more likely for this planet to have an atmosphere than smaller red dwarf planets. But this could also be a curse, as it could have too much of an atmosphere and become another super Venus like K218b. Like Kepler-186f, an extremely delicate balance will be needed to give Gliese 667 cc a habitable temperature, which isn't particularly likely. But unlikely doesn't mean impossible, so of every planet on this list, I'd say only Kepler-186f and Gliese 667 cc have any real chance of habitability. There are plenty of other potentially habitable exoplanets, but most of them we can't say for sure if they could be Earth-like or not because we don't have enough data about them. T-Garden B is a great example of this. We basically have no idea what that planet is like, so I left it out of this video. However, out of all the potentially habitable exoplanets, over the months of research I did making this video, I found one. One planet candidate out of dozens of potentially habitable planets that actually has a good chance of being habitable. This is TOI 700D. Immediately, I should point out that TOI 700D orbits a red dwarf. So, I'm kind of hypocritical for this one, because I specifically eliminated Proxima b in the TRAPPIST-1 system because they orbit a red dwarf. But the difference is TOI 700 D's star is a young red dwarf. This means multiple things that all work in favor of D's habitability. 1. This star is much brighter than a red dwarf of its size should be, because of its young age. This means TOI 700 D orbits further away from its star than other habitable zone red dwarf planets, giving it a much lower chance of losing an atmosphere or becoming tidally locked. D also receives nearly the exact same amount of energy from its star Earth receives from the Sun. Though we did think TRAPPIST-1c would be Venus-like for that same reason, and that's not true. But D still does receive an incredibly Earth-like amount of energy. It's about 70% more massive than Earth, which is still small enough to probably be rocky, but big enough to make holding on to an atmosphere easier. Because of its large size and young age, it also very likely is geologically active, making building up an atmosphere much easier too. There's also the existence of TOI 700c, a second planet in the system. C is about 7 Earth masses, meaning if it formed where it currently is, it should have taken up most of the inner system material, making other planets impossible to form. This means that D must have formed further away from the star. When a star system is forming, the further away you go from a star, the more volatiles like water there are. So, if TOI 700d formed further out, it would have gained more material to build an atmosphere and oceans than it otherwise would have. So, TOI 700d is a lot going for it. There's still a thousand different environments this planet could be like, but out of all the potentially habitable exoplanets I've seen, this is the only one where I could actually see it being an Earth-like world, with oceans and an atmosphere. But this video should serve as a reminder that just because a planet is in the habitable zone, that doesn't make it potentially habitable. Most of these planets are probably as bad as Mercury, Venus, and Mars, if not worse. Habitability is a very unlikely thing. Is it possible? Yes, completely but we haven't found any promising candidates yet. So, whenever you see an article claiming someone found Earth 2.0 or something similar, check for these three things. Its size, temperature, and what type of star it orbits. Those are the three main things that will make or break a planet. Other habitable planets are out there. One day, we will find a truly Earth-like world. I fully believe that. But we just haven't found any yet. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, check out my other videos about exoplanets.